Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel Lossi, Chief Century Thinker with Veritas Group, a sustainability consulting firm based here in Omaha. We help organizations across the country become more resilient and thriving. Um, and I'm super excited to have Dr. Kathy Allen with me as our guest for today's Green Eggs and BAM. Hi, Kathy. Hey, Daniel. Glad to be here. Super excited. Uh, so Kathy and I have known each other for several years now. In fact, I think the first time we met, you were talking about the work you were doing, writing the book, Leading from the Roots, uh, Nature-Inspired Leadership Lessons for Today's World. And we had a lot of fun conversations, some of them in our local nature center, Fontenelle Forest, in the woods. We did a day-long retreat with our colleague, Matt Rezac, with Blue Dot Consulting, and uh, just really hit it off thinking about and asking questions about what can we learn from nature and apply it to our systems, our organizations, and leadership. So. I, this transformation of thinking that you've been working on for decades and doing and practicing was super relevant before the pandemic, and now it's even more relevant, if that's possible. <laughs> so, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, as part of our Green Eggs and Bam series, we are partnering with uh, Artemis Teas and Hardy Coffee Company. So. Since you're a coffee drinker, we're going to be sending you a little bag of locally roasted coffee from Hardy Coffee Company. Um, and with that, let's, let's dive in. I mean, I remember the conversations we had that led to some of the things in this book and, and how do we take these lessons from a living sister system, you know, eco-cycle planning, that's become quite relevant. Uh, recently, we're, we're collaborating on the Leading Through Disruption webinar series that started with the pandemic. Why don't you tell me a little bit about... Um, how you're bringing the living systems lens to the current situation of the pandemic? Uh, well, one simple uh, thing is when you assume something is living, it has certain operating principles that are different than if you assume it's an object. So if you assume that the pandemic was an object, then to you might head towards uh, trying to control it or control the circumstances. But if you assume it uh, operates more like a living system, that it, life finds a way, uh, the pandemic finds a way to spread, it's kind of designed to do that, then you shift from trying to control it to trying to adapt to it. So you, you try to encourage people to adapt their behavior so they're uh, starting to see themselves from a relational aspect that, you know, if I wear a mask and they, and everybody else around me wears a mask and if we socially distance, we're, we're going to be better off, right? That's the logic. So we're adapting as opposed to trying to control it, say it's going to go away or um, we're going to conquer it or something like that. So living systems would teach us that um, COVID and our responses to it are actually better a, we're more adaptive if we treat it as if it's a living system and if we treat each other as a living system. So again, you have these kind of directives that say you should do this or you should do that as if we're trying to control the people around us. But people also are learning or and living systems and they will, their emotions will shape, you know, their behavior and their response to things. And so a living system, we take all of those things into account and we lead accordingly. So we invite or attract people into healthy behavior that might help the larger public health, um, as opposed to trying to mandate one thing or another in the sense of trying to control the population that's going to make individual choices, hopefully ones that reinforce connection and relationship and the good of the whole system, but it won't always work that way. Yeah. Those are some cool critical shifts that you're talking about. And I know that you work with people across the country. You're on Zoom calls with folks across the globe. Um, can you give me an example of one of the organizations or leaders that you're working with and something they're feeling stuck on or worse stuck with? And that the, some of these critical shifts from control to adapt from object to relationship uh, have really helped unlock and, and help them move through either as an organization or a leader. Um, yeah, there are a number of, of uh, possible places I could go, but one of the things I'm noticing as a leadership coach and leadership and change coach is that um, the level of unknowns in the current environment is much bigger than what we're used to. 
and many of the leaders that I work with uh, actually are leaders in part because they're used to about 25% ambiguity in their work. And uh, they feel comfortable with 20 or 25% unknowns. Uh, but now they're dealing with somewhere in that 50 to 70%, depending on the sector of unknowns. And it's stressing them out uh, because- I can relate. They became leaders, <laughs> organizational leaders in part because they were very good at this kind of known and fluid unknown and responding to that. So I think, um, uh, so, so what I'm noticing uh, in the people that I work with, in addition to that stress, um, living systems evolve with information. They live, they uh, grow with knowledge and wisdom. And um, what I found as a, as a cross across the system kind of pattern is the level of learning has really ratcheted up. So they are wide awake, scanning the environment, trying to figure out all the different data points and relative interactions and intersections. One of the thing, other things about a living system is it's interdependent and it's connected. So, you know, the old phrase, the flap of a butterfly's wings in China can create a snowstorm in New York City. Well, we have a new version of that. You know, the, um, a pandemic can, can arise in any place across the globe, but in this particular case, it started in China and it has rippled because of the connectivity throughout the world. And it's not just the connectivity of the virus, but it's also how the virus um, spreads its own contagion and it's also about our own mobility and connectivity to the rest of the world. You know, Europe got it from travelers and all that. So that's really fascinating. You're really good at observing patterns. You talk about the balcony and the dance floor and you're, you're good at zooming out and seeing the patterns happening around us. I'm wondering that, so in our field, we're doing a lot with sustainability and climate action. Are you seeing anything that we're learning from a pandemic that can be applied to climate action, climate, uh, mitigating climate change, becoming more resilient, or so any lessons learned from the pandemic that apply to climate action, or is there a way that we can leverage some things from the pandemic and what we're learning and adapting to accelerate sustainability practices and addressing the climate crisis? Uh, yeah, there are a couple of things come to mind. One is that, um, in our organizations, as we have traditionally structured them, there is always waste. And that kind of waste usually is literally an unrecyclable waste of resources, time, or money. And one of the things that the pandemic has done, because most organizations have to rethink how they're doing business, and in some cases, completely restructure their business model. And in that process, one of the beautiful things about sustainability is by design and by concept, it is trying to figure out what is the most effective and efficient way to structure something in the lightest possible way to get your outcomes. But if you um, see your organization as an object and you're trying to control it, one of the ways you have to spend resources and money and supervision is to try to control the whole system. The system can't grow, it can't learn, it can't change itself, but a living system can do all of those things. So if you think it can't, then you need more people on your staff supervising. You need more people holding people accountable. You need more money and resources to hold control of the system. All of that from a sustainability framework is basic waste. So I think one of the possibilities we have in leading organizations is that COVID has created an opportunity, you could say a challenge or an adaptive challenge that we have to learn to respond to, to rethink the way we've structured our organizations and designed them, and perhaps maybe redesign them in a way that requires less resources to hold them in place and to move forward. And I was just talking with some folks on a website called The Thrivable World, and they were um, talking about the number of, the amount of change that they've seen. Now these are all folks who are firmly anchored in sustainability, regenerative and restorative design. And so these are folks from Canada, from Australia, from South Africa, from the UK, from the Netherlands, 
um, all over the globe, really, uh, U.S. And what they're seeing is really a deep reflection on how we're in relationship to the world and how we're in relationship to each other. So out of out of this COVID, you know, for one one of the people on a call this morning said she used to organize all of her work individually to try to change the way people think so they would be designing things in more sustainable ways. And she wondered what it would take in the, in the world to make this change happen. And now COVID, with COVID, her comment was, I realize now that it wasn't a human being that would make this change possible. It's gonna be the pandemic that's gonna make this change possible. Mm. Wow. Wow, big idea. <laughs> right. Right. So, and, and yeah, think, the, the combination of all the extra unknowns, this living force of a, of a virus making it's doing its thing, making its way across the globe it has forced us to build our, our adaptive capacity. It exposes all of our fragility. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have a lot of that right now. Yeah, sustainability and resilience is, is about um, a flexible, fluid, evolving living system. And fragility is about um, something that isn't designed to actually work through with disruption. And so a lot of our systems are being exposed as fragile. Yeah. Unable to yeah. meet the demand, unable to maintain purpose or function. Which just, to me, emphasizes the imperative that we find ways to co-create a just, thriving, and resilient new next normal. Uh, yes. All the fragility that's showing up. We have the opportunity. So the last question I have for you, and maybe you can pinpoint something, maybe it's too big of a question, but what's it going to take for us to increase our adaptive capacity and really take a hold of this opportunity to create this new just thriving and resilient next normal? Well, I think um, we have already been on this path. And one of the things that's helping us is that we are becoming many people are becoming more aware and more um, uh, individually conscious of our interdependence and our connectivity and also have been exploring alternative ways to think and do things. Uh, so what it's gonna take is that we're gonna have to, we're gonna have a lot of individual actors, and this isn't just a US thing, but I think it's a global thing, who are trying to figure out what's, that, what's next. How do we create what's next? And as our current system becomes more and more fragile, and more and more close to collapse on the adaptive cycle, these new voices and these folks who have been on this journey trying to figure things out, I think are going to be the folks that will help us plant seeds. And as a human being, we are, we are learning living creatures. You know, we are, we're not objects. And we can learn rapidly when we have to, when our back's up against the wall. The other kind of caveat I would put in the possibilities and hope category, but also the reality category, is that our emotions are going to also drive our openness to exploring something new. And so if you're fearful of what you're going to lose, you're gonna hold tighter to the current status quo, no matter how fragile it is, because you've usually been successful in that, that previous system. Um, but the folks who- That's fantastic. <laughs> you know, so you have to, <laughs> You have to work with your own emotions is my point and move yeah yeah fear. we have to we have to build the muscle of courage to yeah. be able to face our fear and address this and i love how you said that the response to fragility is community and connection yes. so th i think that's a great way to end let's learn together that's the whole point of these green eggs and bam tea and coffee chats is we don't have the answer you don't have the answer but together we're going to figure it out together that's kathy great. thank you so much for joining me today um She's got a great book, Leading Through the Roots, Nature-Inspired Lessons, Leadership Lessons for Today's World. She has a very regular blog that you can find down below on the website. And she and I coordinated with a couple other living system leaders just recently on a Leading Through Disruption webinar series that you can see some past resources below. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for joining us, Kathy, and oh, let's uh, learn together.
Thank you, Daniel. <laughs>